my motorcycle helmet camera of choice is the Contour Rome 3, not because it produces the best quality results, but because of this mounting system. It's got these rails either side, which slide into the mount on the side of a helmet rather than on the top, which is my preference. It's got this rotating lens on the front to adjust it so that the horizon's straight, even if you've got the camera at an angle. It's got a laser level in there to assist you in doing that. And it can be operated by this one big switch on the top, which can be used with a set of motorcycle gloves. But the Contour isn't the only side mount helmet camera on the market. There's also the Drift Range. Now, I haven't tested any of these up till now. This is a top of the range model, the Drift Ghost S. It's also got a rotating lens on the front. The mounting system on this side here with a standard tripod screw on it. We've got a screen on this one covered by Gorilla Glass. And we've got access to the microphone. We can plug an external mic in there and do some moto vlogging if we want. It's got these rubberized buttons on the top though, which look a little bit more difficult to operate than that one big switch on the contour. Now make sure you're in a comfy seat because it will take me almost half an hour to go through all the features of the Drift Ghost S. And one thing I will say up front, this is not a budget camera. So I'm expecting great things from it. Now, first off, this is the box. I'll just show you briefly that inside that box, you get another box. And then on the side of that box, you've got some specs. So I'll just zoom in on those quickly just to show you the different things it's supposed to do. Uh, one thing, look in the middle there where it goes in about 160, 127 and 90 degrees. There's a bit of an issue with that. I'll show you more about that later on. It doesn't come with any memory. You'll need to supply your own micro SD card. I'd recommend getting an SDXC card to cope with the higher bitrate modes. On this side of the box, you can see the different things that are inside there, but I'll show you all those in a moment. And notice here there's apps available on the App Store and Google Play Store for the Wi-Fi functionality of the camera. Now inside that box, there's another box. And inside that box, you've got all the accessories for the camera. So let's tip all this stuff out and have a look at it. Now, ignoring the stickers, let's go through the rest of the things one at a time. First off, we've got the instruction booklet. It's in multiple languages. It's just a quick start guide, really. Uh, it's quite clearly laid out. The next thing is this helmet mount, which has got four rubber pads on here and a bit there. The idea is you put a strap through this, perhaps a goggle strap, and put the camera into that part on that side there, which is the mounting system. And there's two more of those in the box. This is a curved adhesive mount, and then we've got a flat one as well. I'll show you more about those in a moment. The next thing is the remote control. It's got two buttons on it and lights down the side. It needs charging out of the box, and it gets charged through this mini USB port on the side here. And of course, you charge it with this lead, which also charges the camera. There's also a Velcro strap, which is to use with that remote control. And then we've got this little door which goes on the back of the camera, which enables you to get access to the microphone hole and that USB port so you can record and charge at the same time. The camera's also got a waterproof door on the back of it, as you can see there. I'll show you more about that in a second. And then we've got this microphone extension lead, just in case your mic plug won't go in through the hole on the back of the camera. Now, the camera mounts on the side here with these little notches with a tripod screw hole in the middle. The clip that comes with it has teeth that uh, match up with those notches, of course. So the idea is you put that on the side, um, get it angled how you want. And of course, that means you can put the camera any direction. Um, but once you've got it exactly how you want, tighten the center part of that up. Those teeth mesh together with the notches and hold it nice and firmly. Now, the mounting system is pretty familiar to anyone who's looked at any other action cameras. You've got the adhesive mount part here, which has holes in the side, and that just slides onto that clip that's on the camera, and the notches on the side of there go into those holes. Now, it doesn't make an audible click, so I thought that was in place, but look, if I waggle it, it comes off again. So you've really got to be careful. It's a little bit unnerving. It'd be better off if it had a click. You'd know when it was on properly. To get it off, push those legs together, and it just uh, slides off the end there. But those notches do seem a little bit small to me. Um, it's not perhaps the strongest mounting system I've seen. I can imagine it falling off. Uh, just make sure it's on there proper. That's all I'd suggest if you get one of these. Right, so you can remove that, of course. Now, that is a standard tripod screw hole, as I mentioned in the middle there. Uh, so you can put the camera on a tripod mount, and if you want, rotate the lens there. That would be uh, upright now with a screen on the top. And of course, if you want, you could have put it the other way up. The back door uh, has a little notch on there. You see the positioning, that's upwards. Now, it will go on either way um, up to a point, so then it gets stuck. So you really have to pay attention to that. Notice I've scratched the inside of there as well, getting it off, because when you rotate, it tends to push on the metal parts inside. 
This is a really annoying door to get on. Very fiddly. You need a lot of strength in those thumbs. You don't have much to grip on. Not very pleasant at all. Uh, much easier to get on is the door which isn't waterproof but does let you get access to the USB and the uh, microphone in the bottom there. It's a lot easier to get that one on. Just twist that centre part on that one. Now the battery is removable, you just pull this clip and this door pops open and you can slide the battery out and you can charge those externally, there are charges available. Uh, that battery there, in my test I got 2 hours and 45 minutes out of it, that's at 1080p30 with the screen off and the Wi-Fi off as well of course. Now the camera is operated by the four rubberized buttons on the top, they're rubberized because it keeps the camera waterproof, but they're very difficult to press as a result, you need good strong fingers. To switch it on, press the front one here, you can see the screen comes on and the green light comes on on the front as well to show we're in the standby mode. Now, look at the bottom of the screen there, look at those tiny little icons, uh, that's telling you what mode you're in, you really need good eyesight for this, look, 1080p 60, I think that says frames per second, the difference between 50 and 60 is just a couple of pixels, it's ridiculous really, it should be a lot clearer than that. Anyway, we're in the video mode, you can see at the top left there, so if we press the front button, we start the camera recording, you can see the red light flashing on the front there. And you can also see the timer counting up at the bottom corner of the screen, if you've got a good eyesight. Now, on top of the camera, there's these two arrows. Those will function as a digital zoom, not an optical, but a digital zoom. And definitely, you shouldn't use digital zoom. I'll explain more about that later on. Press the front button, we go back into the standby mode, and the green LED comes on at the front. Now, let me just show you quickly through the settings. So, to swap between modes, you press that button there, and you press this button here, and then you jump from video to photo to time lapse to burst mode photos. Now these menus are a disaster to be honest, it's the longest way around that you could possibly um, do this to be honest. So that's playback there, if you want to play back the things you recorded earlier on. Those are the settings for the different modes, so if you want to change the video settings, the photo settings, uh, time lapse settings or the burst mode settings, you have to go into that, they're all separate. And then I'll just show you the last one down here, the bottom right one, that's the settings for the camera as a whole, and there's a lot of pages of stuff in here. I'll go through some more of that later on because uh, it's always a bit tiresome. I'll skip through it as quickly as possible. But you can see how hard it is to get through these menus. It's a long process and needs a big strong fingers to push those buttons repeatedly hundreds of times. But enough of this. Let me just show you some sample clips. Now, usual disclaimer applies. Sample clips that I'm going to show you might get degraded by YouTube's re-encoding. So I've got some samples available that you can download. And I've got some 60 frames per second ones there as well, which you can have a look at. Now, first shot, typical shot that I usually show you, actually pretty good this, you've got good sharp uh, image, edge to edge, top to bottom, nice and clear, uh, colours seem a little bit muted, but uh, it is a good quality image. Uh, so let me just show you some more shots from different places, um, as you can see here, again nice and clear. Now, what, look at the date at the bottom right there, I started making this video in early November, and now it's the end of January. This is one of the longest videos it's taken me to make, uh, basically because the weather's been terrible and I've been looking uh, to get some decent shots, especially on my motorcycle. Anyway, you can see inside here, this is the Printworks low light environment. The camera copes pretty well with this. I think it does all right in low light. It looks good to me, this. Now, the camera does have a low light setting in one of the menus, which you can switch on. So I've done that, and this is what the low light setting mode looks like. You know, there isn't an awful lot of difference here. It's slightly brighter, but not much. I'll show you side by side, so you can get an idea of what difference it really does make. It's not an awful lot, is it? So uh, I'm happy with the standard mode. I won't bother going into the menus and switching it to low light. I don't think it's worth the hassle of going through all those menus. Now, one thing with this camera does not have image stabilization. Uh, and as you can see here, when you walk along with a camera without image stabilisation, you do get a bit of shake. Of course, it's got a nice wide angle, which uh, makes things less annoying. Uh, but still, in a camera of uh, this quality, I'd expect it to have image stabilisation built in. Notice the fisheye effect, the barrel distortions I spin around there. That's unavoidable with a wide angle lens like this. Um, now, one thing I want to mention, again, talked about that digital zoom. You can see here, I'm using it uh, on my table here, zooming in and out on my hand. Uh, digital zoom, a lot of people don't quite understand it. All it's doing is cropping out the image. We're not actually zooming in on anything, we're just cropping in on the image. So you can see the quality there, terrible once you've zoomed in, because you haven't zoomed in, you've just cropped out a tiny little section of the image. Uh, definitely worth switching it off in the menus. I'll show you why. Uh, this is a normal image that I've taken and then I'll freeze frame it and I'm going to zoom in, well, 
edit in my editing package and crop down on the clock and you can see the quality of that is exactly the same as the quality of the zoom in inverted commas um, with the camera but the trouble is you can accidentally activate that zoom and then ruin the quality of your images so turn it off in the menus which is something you can do and i was very glad you could because it seems to remember the previous setting you had and if you press it in your pocket you end up with all your video looking terrible now i've got the tram test here where i've got a tram going past just to show you how quick the shutter is and uh, you can see that a little bit because of the sort of angles of the doors and things in fact i've got a treat for you it's a double tram test there you go that's quite exciting wasn't it now um, let's just uh, do a little bit more stuff walking into this building across here or just around the corner because I want to show you a little bit more about how the camera copes with changes between light and dark. You can see on this shot there's quite a bit of fisheye effect there as well. So I'm going to go in here, going from outside to inside. Of course we've got a few things that are going on here. There's uh, changes in lighting, uh, white balance changes, all those kind of things. And I think the camera copes really well with this kind of stuff. Um, it's quite a nice building this one you can see Christmas trees there so you can tell when I shot this notice there's no timestamp on this shot because you can switch it off if you want anyway let's have a listen to some music now so let's take a little bit of a break quality of the nighttime footage here as well you get a nice amount of color through to say it's uh, dark I think that's quite a good quality image for a action camera at night now I've seen reviews of this camera saying that the night quality is terrible and I think those people are probably trying to shoot at night in high frame rate modes and of course you can't actually do that because you don't get enough light into the frame now talk about different modes let's go through a few here uh, videos settings and resolutions you can see you've got quite a few options so let me just lay them out on a page here those are the different video resolutions you can choose from and the different frame rates you can choose in each one I've highlighted ones that particularly stand out as being interesting with different colors there let's show you one of those this is the 240 frames a second mode at uh, 480p and this is what it looks like if i show it at 10 percent of its original speed perhaps not the most exciting thing to show but it's all i could think of at a moment's notice now the field of view this camera is supposed to have three different fields of view you can see them on the screen there the thing is it doesn't really again it's using cropping to get these different uh, field of views let me show you this is what the 160 degree shot looked like I showed you earlier on, nice and sharp and clear. Um, this is what it looks like if I choose 127 degrees. I'm not getting the full 1080p here, I'm just getting a crop out of the centre of the image. And similarly, if I knock it down to the uh, 90 degree mode, I'm also getting the same results. It's just cropping the centre of the image out. So really, I'm losing all the quality. So it isn't different fields of view, it's just cropping the image. So don't choose any of those, just pick the 160 degree mode to get the best quality possible. Now there's almost too many options on these settings because the bit rate you can choose between normal and high. I just shot all my videos in high which is 22.8 megabits a second variable bit rate. That's why you need a nice fast card like an XD card. Scene mode. Now there's three different scenes normal, vivid and low light. Now I've shown you low light before but let's just show it again here. So this is what it looks like normal. Same shot I've shown you probably three times now. So I'll show you what that looks like with the vivid mode notice the colors seem to pop out a bit more at the back the orange got a bit brighter but i don't really like it, it looks a bit artificial and that's the low light mode which doesn't seem to do anything in these circumstances so just stick to the normal one i'd suggest now there's so many settings in this camera it'd take me forever to describe each one of them in detail so i'm not going to do that i'm just going to go into the settings here and just briefly go through them and maybe point out the odd interesting thing so that's the first screen notice screen one of five at the top there uh, pretty much self-explanatory most of these things and the ones that aren't aren't that interesting anyway uh, things like turning the remote control on or off and that kind of stuff 
Um, notice on this one, that's where you switch your digital zoom off. And then on this one, you can turn the date and timestamp off if you want to change the languages. Down the bottom, quite interesting, save settings. So you can change quite a few of the different settings in the camera. And then you can go into that menu and save them into one of three different positions. So once you've got your settings, choose a position, save it into that one. And then similarly, if you want to load those settings up later on, load the same position, A, B or C. So that's a nice feature, but maybe a bit overkill, I think, in an action camera. And of course, that's the firmware version just shown at the bottom there, just to give you an idea. Now, in the video settings particularly, you can see that it's got this thing video tagging at the top here. This is a weird thing. Uh, you can have the camera record over and over and over, but only when you press the button will it save what it's recording. And then at this bit here, you can save th that particular time back in time. So uh, a feature that I don't want and I don't need and I didn't use car dvr mode it will function as a dash cam now you can switch that on and there's a couple of options here uh it'll auto start and stop it'll loop around do the usual dash cam things but m is manual mode if you're using it as a motorcycle helmet camera you want it to loop but it won't auto start because of course it's not receiving power you turn it on manually turn it off manually and in this screen here you can see the different lengths of the segments that you can use when you're using it as a dash cam so let's have a look at the dash cam now now I've muted the sound in this clip so you don't have to listen to me chatting to the missus about God knows what. Uh, but the quality of the dash cam, as you can see here, works really well. Got that nice wide angle again, of course. I've switched it to the 160 degree mode. That's the other one you should use. And it gets a really good view. I've just put it in the windscreen here on a suction cup. Now I want to show you about the gap between clips. So I'll have a look at this clip here. Um, there's a yellow smart car comes past from the left to the right in a moment. And that is split across two different clips. And I've joined them together in this editing package. So there it is. And you can see there's no gap there. So that shows you there's no gap between the clips when they're joined together by the way i'm using iMovie people always ask that and that's what i use to make these videos with anyway i'll pass over to me in the car at night you get a good idea of what the night quality is like and you'll also be able to hear the microphone a little bit more in the car as well this is actually the second time i've taken the car out to get these particular night shots because the first time i took it out uh, when i got home and looked at the footage it was terribly grainy i couldn't figure out what had gone wrong and then I realised I'd still got the camera set in the 1080p 60 mode. Now of course 60 frames a second means that each frame has less time to get the light into it so effectively a 60 frame per second video needs more light than a 30 frame per second one so at night time a 60 frame per second video looks grainy whereas a 30 frame per second one doesn't. So that's why I had to go out and reshoot. I had to shoot it in the best possible mode, which is this 1080p 31. But that also opens up another issue. The fact that when I looked at the camera, I didn't know what mode I was in, is directly attributable to the fact that the screen on the camera, the little tiny icons on there, are so small that you can't discern one from the other. Now it took me a while after that shot before I could get out on the motorcycle because the weather's so terrible. But here I am, I'm going to do it now. Uh, first off, I'm going to attach the camera to the motorcycle helmet. Now I'm putting it on this side and turning the lens the other way up because I've already got a mount on the other side for that contour camera and there's no room. So I'm going to put it somewhere around about there. I'm going to use the curved mount, the adhesive mount, because it curves to the side of the motorcycle helmet. As you can see there, it just fits it perfectly. The curve is just right. So I'll get it in that position. I'm just checking here with the clip to see that it's not going to get on the motorcycle visor as I move the camera in and out. So taking off the adhesive, uh, sticking it to the side of the helmet, and it's a rough position. Remember, I can rotate the mount on the camera. So if I've got that wrong, I can rotate it slightly to get it pointing uh, straight. And then I'm putting the microphone in the back here because I'm going to try a bit of moto vlogging as I go along. I'm going to use this little microphone and shove that inside the motorcycle helmet. That's what it all looks like. So let's have a listen and a look at what it looks like out on the bike. It's probably been about two months since I've been able to get out on the motorcycle. Uh, every time it came around to the weekend or a day off, unfortunately the weather was awful. Now it is fine today, but the temperature is only one degree apparently, and in the uh, wind chill factor it's supposed to be minus four. That's when you're standing still. So as you can imagine, I'm a little bit chilly at the moment. I've got the heated handlebars on maximum, got my winter gloves on, now the sound quality there wasn't the best, but that's no reflection on the camera itself. It's to do with me and where I've got my microphone. It's shoved down inside the padded cheek area and I've got the visor down. So there's a lot of echo and muffle going on at the same time. Um, but 
as far as the image goes, the image quality, after all, this is what the camera is all about. It's about being a motorcycle helmet camera or a bicycle helmet camera, but just a helmet camera. And doing that, it's doing a really good job. Really sharp, edge to edge. You can see the speedo down at the bottom. You can even read the speed on there nice and clearly. So as far as a helmet camera goes, excellent. Now let's just have a look at some photos I've taken with the camera as well. Now I took these photos in the 12 megapixel mode, which is a 4-3 ratio. As you can see, they're really nice and sharp. Of course, we've got that big wide angle lens, which creates that uh, bulgy fisheye effect. There's no way getting away from that. However, the quality of the images is excellent. One thing though, you do have to hold the camera quite steady. Otherwise you end up with shots that look like this. Now I'll just show you the interval photography or time-lapse menus, although I haven't taken any photos the time-lapse photos. You can see you can take them all the way up to 12 megapixels in resolution and at these intervals every half second, one second, all the way across the screen there. I'll just scroll to the right and you can see you can go all the way up to one photo every 60 seconds. Now what happens with this camera, it doesn't create a video file for you. All it does is takes the photos and puts them on the camera. As you can see there, all the photos up to 12 megapixels in a big folder. And then you have to assemble those yourself in a time-lapse assembly program. And at the bottom right here, this is the burst mode. Again, you can set the different resolutions and at 12 megapixels, it's capable of taking 10 shots in one second. I presume that at different resolutions, it can do uh, more shots for longer or something. But basically, that's the only setting that I had a look at on this one. Not really something I tend to use much burst photography. Now, you might have noticed that going between the different menus in this camera is a right royal pain in the bottom. To choose between video and photo, you have to go in through all these menus, select photo, take your photo, move all the way back to video. I mean, you can take a two megapixel photo whilst it's taking video, but if you want to take a full resolution one, you have to swap modes over. The remote control might be a better way to do it because one button swaps between modes. You can see the color of the indicator on the camera there changing between the different modes. And then the other button either starts the video or takes a photo, depending on whichever mode you're in. You can see the colors on the remote change as well to indicate what mode you're in. So that's a quicker way of doing it. Now, when it comes to playing back your video or photos, whatever, go into this menu here. They're all separated out into the individual types, photos, videos, timelapse, burst photography. Go into video here, uh, page forward and back one at a time using those very difficult to press buttons. And then once you've found the one you want to play, uh, select it and then finally it starts playing on the screen. I mean, it's a really long way around. And of course, remember, you can only page through them one at a time like that. So if you want to get through a whole load of videos, it's gonna be pretty annoying pressing those little rubber buttons over and over again. But this is really just for reviewing the thing you've just shot to see whether it came out right and whether you need to shoot it again. You've also got a speaker on the back of the camera there so that you can get a bit of an idea as to how the sound came through. Now, of course, that's not the best way to play back your footage. There are other ways. One way is to plug a HDMI lead into the back of the camera and plug that into your television. It doesn't come with that lead. You'll have to supply your own. I think it's a mini HDMI. Um, switch the camera on. You can see the green light comes on and then the camera is showing a live feed um, through the HDMI lead to the television. And the question is, can you record at the same time? So let's find out. Press the button on the front there. And you can see the red light goes on the camera and it says recording on the screen as well. So yes, you can record and stream live footage at the same time. And of course, you can move between the modes of photo mode and the um, time-lapse and the video mode. One thing you can't do, you can't get into the menus though. And the screen is turned off on the camera when it's plugged into your television. So to get into the menus, you have to pull the wire out and then change your settings in there and then put the wire back in. Now, of course, there are other ways to get your files off this, and one of those is Wi-Fi. Uh, so go into the Wi-Fi menu here, um, turn it on. Again, it's in these settings, quite a long way around. Look for the little icon to pop up at the top left of the screen there to say the Wi-Fi is on eventually, uh, any moment now. Um, but Oh, there, surprise. Right, so it's on. Now we can connect up to it using uh, the phone here. I've got the app already installed on my phone, so just click on the ghost s thing i think i've already done this once i must have got the password in there but there you go it's connected up on wi-fi and as you can see there inside the app you can get a live view finder feed of what the cameras see however when you press record notice the viewfinder disappears off the phone and it just shows on the camera so you can't see what you're recording over wi-fi you can only start and stop recording 
and of course you can change these settings on the camera press this cog at the bottom here get into all the different setup menus i mean there's loads of things you can change on this camera there's too many setup options in my opinion too many things you can change and a lot of them you don't even need to go near it's a little bit convoluted now you can also change between video mode of course and photo mode or time lapse or whatever you want and here's me just taking a still there now and of course the screen does stay on when you're doing photos it's just not with videos now one issue i had if i go into the gallery here to try and play back something on the camera look cannot connect to camera so there's some sort of app issues i was unable to get files off the camera over wi-fi other issues i had with the camera it has locked up on more than one occasion it's always been when I've been messing around with the settings and not when I've been shooting videos. I haven't lost any footage. I suppose that's the only saving grace. But the only way to get out of the situation is to take the battery out briefly, which will reset the camera. Another thing that I don't like is the way that the files are stored on the memory card. You get the MP4s, as you can see here, but they're intermixed with these little thumbnail MP4s, which are the files that are designed to be streamed over Wi-Fi, I think, to the application. But you're in danger of uploading those into your editing package and having two of everything. The full resolution one and then this little smaller file as well and the other way to stop that happening is to delete all those files every time you want to upload the memory card to your computer or individually click the files you want they do get in the way they're a bit of a nuisance as far as weight goes the ghost s is quite a heavy camera 172 grams which is about six ounces and that's actually heavier than my contour roam 3 camera which has a metal body on it and the drift of course only has a plastic body it's time for me to sum up the things that I do and don't like about this particular camera. And I'm going to start off with the don'ts. And one of those are the rubberized buttons. I just don't like the way that I can't press them whilst wearing a motorcycle glove. And they're also very difficult to press with your bare fingers as well. The screen's nice and large, but then why are the icons on it so small? Tiny little digits at the bottom there. Very difficult to determine the difference between 50 and 60 frames per second, for example. And the rear door on the camera. Very difficult to remove and put back on again. The operating system, complete disaster area. Too many screens, too many options, too convoluted to get from one thing to the other. Just a really bad setup, could be a lot simpler. There's things in there that you definitely should switch off as well. Digital zoom, terrible feature, ruins everyone's video, and field of view. It says it does three different fields of view. It doesn't. It just does one and then crops in on them. And then, of course, I've had issues with my camera freezing up, which I wouldn't expect on a camera that costs the amount that this one does. And, of course, I had those app connectivity issues, but I'm guessing that can probably be rectified with an app update. Now, of course, there are things to like about the camera. The fact it's got a rotating lens is something that's essential for a side mount helmet camera. And it's got microphone in, which is quite a rare thing to have in an action camera as well. And you can't deny that the actual results you get when using it as a helmet camera are excellent. Now, I'm anticipating that most of the comments I get under this are going to be about the price of the camera. And people are very price conscious. For example, when I reviewed a Seiko watch recently, it cost just over £100. People thought that was very expensive. Now, that's not an expensive watch. To me, this is an expensive watch. But, of course, things are all relative. I mean, for example, motorcycles. In the UK, the best-selling bike over 125 cc's is the BMW R1200 GS. Do you know how much that bike costs? close to £13,000 and I'd imagine most owners are going to fit a few optional extras for example an extra fog light at £340 that costs more than this camera did now the average wage in the UK is supposed to be somewhere around about £26,500 there's a heck of a lot of people earn an awful lot less than that but there's an awful lot of people earn massive amounts of money there's over 400,000 people earn more than a hundred thousand pounds a year and to them buying a camera for 300 pounds is probably just a drop in the ocean so ultimately i think what i'm trying to say is it's down to the individual to determine what they want to spend their money on and if you want to buy a ghost s there's links in the video description and up there you'll also find links to downloadable samples but that's it for the moment as always thanks for watching